What's up, everybody? I'm Phil Perry. Welcome into the Next Pats podcast. We have so much to get to. Here today, we're going to be reacting to the Gerard Mayo introductory press conference that occurred at Gillette Stadium earlier this week. We're going to talk about why Bill Belichick was a presence there. And then we're going to hit you with our full one-on-one with Gerard Mayo that happened after the press conference. We're going to get into some interesting topics of conversation. Does the guy want to call plays? How is he going to go about hiring an offensive coordinator? What does he make of imposter syndrome? Is he feeling it now? And how might that actually serve as a motivator? We're also going to get to know a little bit better a couple of names that have been associated with the Patriots, one Patriots employee, one potential Patriots employee later in the podcast. But first, let's start with my takeaways from the Mayo introductory press conference. 15th head coach in franchise history, first black coach in franchise history. This, to me, was a tone-setting kind of day. If you were looking for real meat when it comes to his football philosophy, X's and O's, what he's going to prioritize in terms of the -the on-the-field product, you didn't get a whole lot. But that's not what that day was about, in my opinion. It was about setting the tone. And it is, of course, a changing tone, going from Bill Belichick to Gerard May. You got to know him a little bit as a person. It was a unique head coaching introductory press conference, in my opinion, because a lot of us already know him. He's been around. He's been here in the region since 2008. First round pick has been a big personality since the moment he arrived in Foxborough. He obviously did television with us here. People got to know him in that setting. People have gotten to know him as an assistant coach now since 2019 and doing some of the interviews that he's been able to do, whether it's at a podium or on a Zoom call, including one Zoom call late in the season where he responded to reports of rubbing people the wrong way that I think really shed a lot of light on who he is as a person, how thoughtful he can be, what kinds of things he's willing to share in a situation like that one. But you heard about his grandfather, Walter Johnson, his experience in the Air Force, how it molded Mayo and his three brothers and the discipline that he instilled in them. You got to know something about his coaching style, I thought. Again, even if you've watched him on the sidelines help coordinate that defense with Steve Belichick, he's a teacher. He wanted to harp on that. He wants to grow leaders. He wants to empower those he coaches. Again, messages that we've heard in the past. We've talked to him about game planning defensively and allowing his players to help shape the game plan. He gives them the canvas, is what he calls it. He tells them they have to stay on the canvas. Can't be spraying that paint all over the lot now. But paint this thing how you want it to be painted. So that's how he's going to function as a head coach as well. He's going to empower those around him, his assistants, and of course, his players. can be very different that way in the Gerard Mayo era. I think he also saw that he's not afraid to push back on his bosses. You know, as as collaborative as he wants to be, he does have that in him to say, no, wait, I actually don't believe that. And I'm going to tell you what I believe now, and I'm going to go on a different path here. You know, we saw that when Robert Kraft talked about how he he doesn't see color and Gerard Mayo responded immediately by saying that he does. That's his boss. And he went about it in such a way not to embarrass Robert Kraft. I don't think he did in real time but he also made it clear where he stands on a topic that a lot of people would never want to touch at a press conference. I thought that spoke volumes about who he is and how he'll interact with people around him as a head coach, whether they're above him on the masthead or below. He also talked about wanting to rely on experts. And that's particularly pertinent when it comes to the front office and their personnel decisions that are upcoming. Do you always go with the experts, whether that's Matt Groh, Elliot Wolf, Steve Cargile, Pat Stewart, Cam Williams, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of those guys, one of those guys, two of those guys, three of those guys. Do you always just go with what they tell you because they're the experts and you might not be. You've been strictly a coach since 2019, but You better believe he has ideas on personnel and he's going to have a say in personnel. He's the head coach. He's going to be determining who plays in these games. 
So he has to have a say, whether it's the final say or not, I guess, is TBD. But he's going to rely on those experts. And I think how we fill in the blanks from there is one of the biggest questions surrounding this team. We'll hit on that a little bit later, but I did want to get to the presence of Bill Belichick as well. He was in the building, friends. He certainly was in the building. Uh, not only would Mayo, I thought jokingly, said he needed a break from Bill when he retired and he went to go work for Optum and he started building a career in the finance world. But Belichick was in the building when Gerard Mayo referred to echo chambers. He was in the building when Mayo referred to silos. And I think what he was getting at there when he mentioned those things is that Bill Belichick could communicate in a way where he was the arbiter of all information. Everything went through Bill Belichick. He was a one-man supercomputer when it came to football operations and where everyone was, what their timelines were, how their calendars looked, the information that needed to be coming in, and maybe even at times going out, whether it's to scouts on the road or to other teams in terms of discussing their personnel and potential trades, he was able to keep all of that straight. Mayo wants help. I think that's one major difference here is that he is looking for help. He acknowledges that he needs help in a way that Bill Belichick didn't feel like he did. Whether he actually did or not, maybe a different topic for a different day. But that's going to be one major, major difference. And I've shared it on the podcast here previously. I know we've talked about it on television as well, but I've talked to a number of people on the personnel side for the Patriots that are still here and asked them before this transition was made how it might look if and when Gerard Mayo was named head coach. Collaboration, transparency, everyone was expecting more of those things with Gerard Mayo in that seat that Bill Belichick has occupied for so many years. Now, Bill Belichick was also present in the presser in positive ways, I thought. He was complimentary of Belichick on multiple occasions. He still calls him coach. He, coach says all the time, you know, hard work works. You're going to hear it in our one-on-one. -on -one. He's going to refer to smart, tough, disciplined. That's Those have been three adjectives that Bill Belichick has used to describe his ideal football team for a long, long time. Smart, tough, disciplined. And that might be the closest to the bone that anybody gets at least at this stage in Gerard Mayo's head coaching tenure, as to what his football philosophy is or what he's looking for or what his team is truly about, what characteristics he's going to value, put a premium on. Smart, tough, disciplined. That's Bill Belichick. That's Bill Belichick speaking through Gerard Mayo at the press conference. And so I think it's clearer than ever after this introductory presser that Mayo's hiring is about maintaining that which had helped make the organization so successful for a generation while also, also tweaking some of the football philosophies. thought it was really interesting to hear Gerard Mayo say it's a different game than when I was drafted in 2008. Again, the ghost of Bill Belichick is somewhere in the room when that gets said because the implication is the guy who came before me maybe didn't see it that way. Whether he meant it that way or not, I think it's fair to read it that way as it leaves his lips. So they're going to tweak some of the football philosophies, and they're obviously going to, to tweak the style in which some of those familiar messages, some of those very Belichickian messages, quite frankly, are delivered to players. All right, let's get to our one-on-one -on -one with Gerard Mayo right now. Again, we're talking imposter syndrome. Very interesting on that. That's at the end of the interview. You're going to have to listen to the whole thing to get to that portion. We're going to talk about his confidence in himself and maybe some of the trepidation he has in hiring an offensive coordinator and going through that search, which we anticipate is about to really get underway, whether that means Bill O'Brien is going to be back or not. I think he will 
in some ways be in the mix there. Although if I were a betting man right now, I would say Bill O'Brien is not back in New England in 2024. And we're also going to talk about whether or not Gerard May wants to call plays. Does he want to call defensive plays? He hasn't been doing it. Steve Belichick has been doing it. Now, we know Steve Belichick's future may be somewhat uncertain. We know Albert Breer reported that the offer has been made to Steve Belichick to stick around here in New England. We know for a fact that Gerard Mayo and Steve Belichick remained close throughout the course of this year and have been very close for a long period of time now. And so maybe he's back and he's calling plays, but we've seen this before. Mike McDaniel is the most recent and most obvious example to me of an assistant coach who hadn't called plays previously, then became head coach and said, you know what? I'd like those duties now. Thank you very much. Now, Mike McDaniel's calling plays in Miami. Never did it in San Francisco. Never did it for Kyle Shanahan. That was Kyle Shanahan's gig. So does Mayo want to be the defensive version of that? We're discussing all that and much, much more. It's coming up right now. All right, we're here with Gerard Mayo, the 15th head coach in New England Patriots franchise history. The first black coach in Patriots franchise history. You said, you better believe it. That means a lot to me. Yeah. Tell us why. It absolutely means a lot. You know, uh, just to see this opportunity come to fruition, uh, it's been a lot of prayer, a lot of hard work, not only for me, but for my community and for my friends and things like that. Um, it was just a surreal moment seeing my grandparents up front where they had to deal with the racial divide a lot more than we have to deal with it now. Now, I'm not saying, you know, racism doesn't exist. I'm saying it's different, right? It's different. Back then, um, you know, just thinking about my grandparents and where we, where we are today, it came full circle. Man. I want to ask you about your grandfather specifically, yeah. Walter Johnson, Chief Master Sergeant in the yeah. Air Force. In the Air Force, yep. Helped raise you. You've been very That's open right. about that, you and your brothers. How has he maybe helped shape you as a coach? Yeah. You talked about some of the discipline he That's instilled right. in That's you right. during your press conference. Yeah. And I'm wondering how some of those principles carry over into your, your new job now as head coach here. Yeah, you know, he always would, you know, talk about just working hard and things will happen. And until he always used to talk about action. It's not about, you know, saying you're going to do something. It's about action. And it's about getting the job done. And I've learned that from him time after time after time. And to see him on the front row today meant so much. And he got a little choked up as well. But as a chief master sergeant, you would never see him get choked up. I, I think probably in the last two, whatever, like these two big moments, draft and this one, those are the only time I've seen him really get emotional. And it kind of put a lump in my throat as well. But uh, he, he, he did a good job. Job well done. You're a man, obviously, with a versatile background, mm -hmm. player, coach, business person media member briefly yeah. yeah i'm curious did we win an emmy can you get, <sighs> did we win an emmy i don't know I you think, might have no nah, i think i didn't get i it. didn't get one for that yeah keep working on yeah man. keep working <laughs> i'll get there eventually hard work works that's right i'll get there eventually that's right, that's right. i did want to ask you though to give me an elevator pitch mr business person yeah okay elevator pitch the patriots football team will be about what under gerard mayo it will be about winning First and foremost, it would be about it really doesn't matter what we do if we don't win games. So that has to be at the top. I would also say it's about developing and aspiring to be something that uh, you thought you could never do. And there are a lot of resources around here to help people get to that next level. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about winning to get there. What will you prioritize on the field? I'm curious because you mentioned something during your press conference where you said Game's a lot different now yep. than it was when I was drafted in 2008. So from an on-the-field standpoint, what does Gerard Mayo believe in? There are fans that are watching this, listening to this right yeah. now, that want to know what you're about. What's your football philosophy? Yeah. You know, Coach used to always talk about smart, tough, and dependable. And those have worked. Uh, and we'll continue to show up with our team. I would say we want to have a smart team. We want to have a team that really enjoys playing for one another and takes accountability uh, in everything that happens, both in the building and outside the building. I would also say, you know, we have good leaders on this team and we've had good leaders on this team. And I encourage any former player, 
to come back in the building. I think it's important. So when you talk about player development and you know guys that have gone through some of those ups and downs, it's important to get them back in the building. You saw Devin McCourty here today. Yeah. You saw Rob Nikovich here today. Yep. Are, there, are we going to see these guys on the Patriots coaching staff <laughs> at some point? Well, here, so. I, w- I would say Devin is doing a great job in media, and, and Rob has his podcast, so they won't be coaching. I don't <laughs> think they can handle the hours. How about you? Obviously, major voice on the defensive side of the ball. I'm curious, though, now, as head coach, Will you be calling plays next year for the Patriots? I mean, we're still we're still evaluating uh, the coaching staff. Uh, what I will say is, look, I'm not going to sit here and act like I know everything about offense. You have to have like experts or you know, professionals in that world. It's one thing to have X's and O's on a piece of paper. It's another thing to like teach a guy how to do it. And I'm going to lean on some people. I'm going to lean on some coaches that I have a lot of respect for as well to kind of help guide me through this process. Who would you lean on when it comes to the offensive coordinator hire that we all are anticipating potentially yeah. could happen? Because that part, the offensive side of the ball, obviously struggled last year. And I think what would be a valid question of you would be, well, your defensive coach, defensive player, what makes you the right guy to find the guy? Yeah who's going to shape this offense moving forward? That's a good question. And, and once again, I'll go back to collaboration. Um, you know, ownership, 1,000%. They have a lot of resources and contacts across the league to, to help us with this. Um, but we'll see how it, how it shakes out. But I, that's the first person. Any hire, offense, defense, special teams, they can vet those guys. And look, I'm not going to bat 1,000 in year one. I'm sure someone will change in year two. But at the same time, like, I have to go with my gut. And, and Thunder talked about his gut a lot. Uh, there is a book, Don't Trust Your Gut, though. I will say that. But his, his has never been wrong. And so hopefully I'm the last one of these that he has to do. He has a pretty good track record when it yeah. comes to, to hiring head coaches. He's That's hired right. two Hall of Famers yeah. thus far. Robert Kraft mentioned he wants to evaluate the people that he has in-house when it comes to personnel. Yep. Yeah. How much time might that take? Because when it comes to personnel, we know the draft, free agency, sometimes you don't know whether a decision was a good decision or a bad decision That's right. until you're three, four years down the road to see how that player developed in your system. So I'm curious how you can evaluate in the short term or yeah. are the people that are here going to be people that you lean on for three or four years? I would say it's a combination. Um, look, we can definitely evaluate those guys, but it's all about timing, just what you talked about, like the drafts coming up, free agencies coming up. So, you know, it's all about timing, getting the right people in there. And look, as we go through the evaluation process with ownership, with key players, that's when we can kind of like work, work on that. It's not really a priority for us, you know what I mean? This year, this year. Last question I want to ask you. You have been open in the past talking about imposter syndrome. Yeah. It's something you felt as though you've experienced since you're in high school. That's right. And, you know, it's a pretty um, widely known experience for a lot of different people when they look at themselves and they say, do I really belong here? Yeah. Do I have what it takes to be doing what I'm doing right now? How long until I'm found out That's right. as an imposter, quote unquote? Yeah. And I think a lot of people might view that as a negative feeling. Yeah. How do you turn that into a positive potentially in this new role that you're in to help get you to where you want to be as a head coach? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think imposter syndrome is a negative thing. I think it uh, it drives me. It drives me. And I'll give the example. When I got to Tennessee, I was a four-star linebacker, and we had all these good players around, and I would ask myself, am I supposed to be here? These guys might be too good. But I really just use that to do all the extra stuff in the in the film room, in the weight room, and things like that. Same thing when I came here. Like when I was drafted here tenth overall, you would think a tenth overall pick wouldn't have that feeling. And everyone has that feeling in certain ways, but everyone wants to act tough. Oh, I don't have it. Oh, I got it. I can handle it. But once again, if you feel that way, like, oh, I can handle it, maybe you're not stretching yourself far enough. Because as you start to stretch further and further away from comfort, that's when the imposter syndrome starts to come up. And how you handle that is important. Some people paralyzed by it. For me, it's a, it's a, a motivator. It's a motivator like, I gotta get it done. Drop mail. Congratulations. Thanks, bro. Thanks so much for spending some no, time with us here. Thank you. I really appreciate Mayo spending some time with us there at the end of a long day for him. A lot of media responsibilities and it's only the beginning. 
he's going to have to be dealing with a lot of different things now that he's never had to deal with before. And obviously he'll never go through another introductory press conference again here in New England. So it might not be quite that intense when it comes to his responsibilities to the media, but there's going to be a lot on his plate that hasn't been on his plate before. And he's going to need some help. He's going to need real support. And I think that gets to one of the names that I mentioned off the top of the podcast that you might be somewhat familiar with, but not completely familiar with. And you might have some questions as to their responsibility with the team. And I'm talking about Robin Glazer, who has been a senior executive for the craft group for a long time now, since 2007. Her title has changed. She is now executive vice president of football business and senior advisor to the head coach. She most recently served as senior vice president of business affairs and chief administrative and compliance officer for the team. Someone who is very highly regarded throughout the organization, obviously very trusted by the Kraft family, very trusted person for Gerard Mayo. And that senior advisor to the head coach role is going to be something that is new to her. That is not the role in which she served for Bill Belichick. And so there are going to be a lot of things that come across Gerard Mayo's desk that she will be able to help him with as someone who has handled a variety of different responsibilities for this team over the years. For instance, she was the compliance officer during COVID. She had to make sure that all the I's were dotted and T's were crossed during what was a very complicated time in the NFL, as I'm sure you all remember as fans of the league and understanding how things changed at a moment's notice during the pandemic. She's very much involved when it comes to facilitating contracts, not necessarily negotiating the deals, which would be a responsibility that falls to, you know, or, or did fall to Bill Belichick and guys like Scott Pioli, Nick Casario, uh, Macro, Matt Patricia, at times, you know, really in the football operations department that hasn't necessarily been her role is my understanding, but in terms of hammering out the writing and the language of, of all the contracts, that was something that Glazer was able to help with for the New England Patriots. She has a legal background, so could oversee sort of the ironing out of those kinds of details. It's also my understanding when it comes to the non-football football business, she is very much involved and helps determine how resources are allocated to various departments, you know, whether it's IT or nutrition, nutri head nutritionist Ted Harper you know, goes to the team and says, hey, we need X, Y, and Z to make sure that uh, our team cafeteria is, is up to snuff with the rest of the league. You know, figuring out what they can do on that front and the, the, the resources that can be allocated there, that might fall on her plate. That's just a, a for instance. So just to be clear, because I think there is some haziness around the role that she may take on moving forward for the Patriots here, especially after she was mentioned in Seth Wickersham's report for ESPN. It's my understanding she is not an X's and O's football person. And and she will be helping Gerard Mayo. And I'm sure others on the football staff when it comes to non-football, non-on-the-field issues that may pop up for a head coach. And again, everything I've been told by people who know her well, having a chance to speak with several of them over the course of the last couple of days, really intelligent, really well-respected for her ability to adapt and change and take on a variety of different things sometimes all at the same time. For example, just another role that I've been told she's been very involved with is players in their social justice initiatives. So whether it's working with Matthew Slater or the McCordys or Dietrich Wise, or she has been very involved in, in helping those players get whatever it is that they want off the ground when it comes to social justice. So we'll see how her, her role um, forms and develops over the course of time. It's just been a couple of days now that that she's officially had this title. Um, and so that'll be interesting to track. And my guess is we see her more now because she has this as part of her title, the senior advisor to the head coach. And so maybe we see her more with Gerard Mayo as he's going about his day-to-day -day work. Um, but 
if you're sitting at home and you're thinking she's going to be picking players on draft night, it's, it's my understanding that's not going to be the case. Very valuable person, but her value is going to manifest itself in different ways. All right, quickly, just to get to another name that has been associated with the Patriots, potential Patriot moving forward, potential Patriots employee, Tem Lukabu. He interviewed for the defensive coordinator job. He was the outside linebackers coach for the Carolina Panthers. I think what is uh, more relevant for our purposes in terms of his background, he has worked with Greg Schiano. He has worked here locally as a defensive coordinator for Jeff Halfley at Boston College. He has crossed paths with Steve Belichick and spent time with Steve Belichick at Rutgers, as did Halfley. They were all there at the same time. And so there is a, a Patriots connection there for Lukabu, and doesn't surprise me that he's interviewing for the defensive coordinator job. And based on everything I've heard about Lukabu is he sounds like someone who would mesh really well with Gerard Mayo. And I'm going to be writing about Lukabu for NBCSportsBoston.com, but I did get a chance to speak with Jeff Halfley, friend of the Next Pats podcast, by the way about Lukabu and, and what he would bring to his next team. And here's just a sampling of what Halfley told me. He's not going to be rattled. He's very stoic in his approach. When stuff gets heated on game day, he is very under control. Same demeanor all the time. And Halfley really points out in terms of his relationship with players and why it has worked in Halfley's opinion, as well as it has at Lukabu's various spots. He starts with honesty. He's going to talk to the players and with the players. He's going to teach. He's going to coach. He's not going to yell and scream. He's not going to embarrass anybody. That's not what he's about. He's a highly intelligent, very well-organized coach who has a huge background with different schemes. And he's been around some really good football coaches, Halfley reminded me. And, and Shiano being among them, and we know Greg Shiano spent a very brief period of time here in New England as defensive coordinator, and then it was announced soon thereafter that he was leaving the team. But he has been not only in Halfley's defensive scheme um, and found success there, which is uh, for the NFL fans that haven't watched a ton of Boston College football over the years, it's going to be more of your Seattle three. Remember, Halfley has experience in the San Francisco system with Robert Sala, that sort of um, Dan Quinn, Pete Carroll, coaching tree, right? So that Seattle cover three style scheme, but also under Shiano, he really got to know a, a different type of scheme, which is more man heavy and more too high safety structures. So he has this well-rounded X's and O's background combined with this stoic approach with this cerebral approach that I think would really work in New England. And under Gerard Mayo, they, they can be versatile. Now, we know they like to use a lot of man. And in the past, they've, they've used a lot of single high safety looks. And maybe they can tweak and adjust their personnel to do even more of that this coming year than they did this past year. When they didn't have it felt like a true free safety, they could use a variety of players back there, but they didn't have that consistent Devin McCourty replacement to play in the post and allow them to play as much cover one maybe as they – as they usually would like. They were still near the top of the league when it came to man-to-man -to -man coverage this year, uh, but it'll be interesting to see what additions they make to that defense. But if Lukabu ends up being the defensive coordinator, or maybe he ends up serving as a positional coach. Again, he's in Carolina right now. They're changing their head coach. We don't know who that will be moving forward, but if he ends up being a free agent, Lukabu that is, maybe he's D.C., Maybe in the process of interviewing for the defensive coordinator job, you get to know him. Uh, you have this background with him already via Steve Belichick. Maybe Steve Belichick sticks around and Lukabu ends up providing a very valuable function to your defensive coaching staff, which is maybe his linebackers coach. Remember, Trav Mayo was a linebackers coach here. Steve Belichick was linebackers coach. In theory, say Steve Belichick stays and becomes defensive coordinator. Well, they need somebody to coach their linebackers. Maybe Lukabu could be that guy. But again, he's interviewing for the defensive coordinator job. Good for him. He's, he, based on what I've heard of him and what we'll be able uh, to write about him here for the website soon, it sounds like he is certainly qualified and an intriguing candidate, no doubt, to play a real role for this Patriots 
defensive staff come 2024. How about on the offensive side, offensive coordinator? That, to me, is going to be a really interesting discussion as it happens. Who is in Gerard Mayo's network that would work as offensive coordinator? Who might come from the outside, but still has some connections to the team and to the area? Who could make sense as long as they interview with Mayo in such a way that uh, he feels as though he can work closely with this person and they're going to mesh and they're going to see the game the same way. And Mayo's going to appreciate and respect that person's vision offensively. And I would think especially their ability to work with young quarterbacks or at least provide guidance within a scheme that has been proven to work with young quarterbacks. And if it's not Bill O'Brien, it would not be surprising to me if you ended up pulling somebody from the Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan tree. Now, some of you may roll your eyes at that suggestion. Well, you just get whoever's sat in a room one time with Sean McVay and you hire him as offense coordinator and you shrug your shoulders and hope it works out. That's not exactly it. And if you look around the league, um, Cincinnati with Joe Burrow, Green Bay, now previously with Aaron Rodgers, now with Jordan Love, Houston with C.J. Stroud, Miami had two at Tungavailoa somehow, somehow in the MVP conversation earlier this year, thanks in large part because of that scheme and the talent around him. I'm not saying you could be an offense coordinator just by – sitting in a room with Sean McVay and and listening to him in a few meetings or same deal for Kyle Shanahan. I'm not saying that, but I am saying if you've sat in a lot of those meetings and you understand the schemes that they run and you understand how they coach and how they communicate their offense and their philosophies to their players, there's a decent chance as long as you got the right players that you're going to find success. And so here are a couple names that, that are connected to that tree. Zach Robinson. Now, Zach Robinson, actually a seventh round pick of your New England Patriots back in 2010. If any of you remember that off the tops of your heads, you are sickos and you are in the right place because this is the podcast for draft sickos. And if you can remember a seventh round pick, even if it was for your favorite team over a decade ago for a guy who really never played, kudos. Respect, respect. You know you get that here at the Next Pats podcast for having that kind of intel. But Zach Robinson now is going to have a bunch of intel on how the McVay system works. He's been with Sean McVay since 2019. Assistant quarterbacks coach, assistant wide receivers coach, assistant quarterbacks coach. Now, since 2022, he's been the pass game coordinator and quarterbacks coach for the Rams. So he's worked with the most important position in the sport. He played it at a high level. You know, he was in the NFL from 2010 to 2013, Patriots, Seahawks, Lions, Bengals. But now has worked under one of the two or three best offensive minds on the planet and coaching up the most important position within that scheme for Sean McVay for several years now. So would have a lot of value. Friend of the Next Pets podcast, by the way. We had him on the podcast. This was years ago to talk about Mason Rudolph when we were considering Mason Rudolph as a potential Tom Brady successor. On the one hand, very scary. On the other, eh, I ended up not really having a plan for a little while. It took a couple of years. And then they blew that one to smithereens. So uh, not saying that would have worked out, but just, just funny to go back in time. That was back in the days when we were all looking at Kyle Laletta. Remember that name? Had a great senior bowl that year lacrosse player I think his dad or his uncle played at Navy anyway anyway everybody assumed Bill Belichick was going to be all over Kyle Laletta out of Richmond uh, that was that same year neither here nor there let's talk more offensive coordinator candidates how about Shane Waldron offensive coordinator from Seattle most recently but again changes to the staff there you're assuming he's going to be available and so why would this be a fit Shane Waldron from around here went to Tufts Worked for the Patriots, quality control coach in 2008, tight ends coach in 2009. Ends up working at BB&N, if you're familiar with the ISL in the greater Boston area. 
I was the offensive coordinator there in 2011, UMass from 2012 to 2015, all kinds of local ties for Shane Waldron, somebody who grew up in Oregon, but went to Phillips Academy, uh, Phillips Andover, and played football there, went on to play football at Tufts. And so uh, he has a, a bunch of local connections. He also has a bunch of Sean McVay connections. Quality control guy for Washington in 2016. Ends up going with McVay to the Rams in 2017. Tight ends coach, pass game coordinator, uh, pass game coordinator and quarterbacks coach. So some of these similar titles, uh, almost like they alternated years in some ways with Zach Robinson. Uh, but pass game coordinator in 2020. And then in 2021, he becomes the OC for the Seahawks, where his brightest moment was probably Geno Smith last year and all the success that Geno Smith had, you know, late in his career and allowing him uh, to find his way and really earn a ton of dough. And so is that a name that the Patriots would be interested in, that Gerard Mayo would feel like could work here in New England? Kellen Moore might be expensive, but again, if you get Jim Harbaugh going to the Chargers, Kellen Moore was there as offensive coordinator working with Justin Herbert. Still a very highly respected guy with a lot of play calling experience, clearly. Maybe that's something you covet. Maybe you don't want necessarily uh, a first time OC like Zach Robinson would be, like Nick Cayley would be. That's another name. Former Patriots tight ends coach, tight ends coach for the Rams this past year. Very few people, aside from Shane Waldron and Jed Fish, who was recently named head coach of the University of Washington, very few people that I can think of who have coached under both Sean McVay and Bill Belichick. Nick Cayley would be one of them. Instrumental in game planning here in New England for a long time with Josh McDaniels. He, he clearly has that McDaniels offensive system down, which is one of the most voluminous offenses that is in any way, shape, or form still kicking around the league or any branch is still sprouting off of that tree. Kaylee would be one of those. And so has a variety of experience with a number of different schemes that were baked within that Patriot scheme, but now has the McVay system under his belt after a year there out in LA. Would he be interested in coming back and being an offensive coordinator for the Patriots? But people in the league that I've spoken to recently view him as a future offensive coordinator. Is that this year? Is it down the line? Does he want to be a quarterback's coach first to better set him up, maybe with more offensive coordinator opportunities down the road if he gets the opportunity to, to coach that position that it seems like um, a lot of these OCs and play callers have, but not all, but a lot of them do. I'm not sure, but that would be another name worth considering, especially because he has worked with Mayo, obviously on a different side of the ball, but he's been in the same building as Mayo, uh, both as a player, and a coach. And so you would think there's a relationship established there and maybe he is an option for the Patriots running their offense moving forward. Okay. So you got a handful of names there on the offensive coordinator front. That's a search that they're going to have to get going on relatively soon. And so we're going to start to hear about interviews uh, and hear some names bandied about that come into new England and keep in mind to satisfy the Rooney rule for coordinator positions. You do have to interview one external minority candidate for head coaches general managers. It's two external minority candidates for coordinators. It is one. And so that's a process that they're going to have to go through right now and figure out who is going to be leading them into the future from a scheme standpoint and from a leadership standpoint with potentially a young rookie quarterback. Last thing here on the personnel front, because there was one element of Robert Kraft's comments that were made at the Gerard Mayo introductory press conference that I found interesting where he said, when it comes time to make important decisions on the roster, that he will, quote unquote, appoint someone to make those decisions. So if you were thinking this might be a three-headed monster between Elliot Wolf, the macro, and Gerard Mayo, based on the owner's comments, that doesn't sound like it will be the case. Although I can tell you there are people in the building who are viewing the way things are set up right now as the way they will be set up when the draft rolls around. So that means this group is taking you through free agency, is going to take you through the draft, and might be setting you up for the next five years based on the decisions that they make. Whether there is an appointed general manager, an appointed 53-man roster control person, whether they have the title of GM or not, however that shakes out, 
the belief in the building and from those outside the building who have been looking at the building and wondering if they might have a chance to enter the building in a senior role, if not in the senior leadership position on the personnel side of things. And their belief is the way it's set up now is the way it will be set up at least through the draft. And then once you get through the draft, maybe there's an addition made is how it's been put to me. Again, if Robert Kraft wants to open this thing up to interviews, which he, my belief is he will have to by league rule if he wants to give Elliot Wolf or Matt Groh 53 man roster control, and that gets written into their contracts. It's my belief that by league rule, you have to open that job up to a real search, satisfy the Rooney rule, go through the process. So if he wants to go that route, which he in some ways suggested by saying that he's going to appoint someone and that they're going to be doing interviews soon, then in my opinion, excellent. Open this thing up. Get as many ideas into the building as you can. Talk to as many talented people as you can. Pick their brains on where the roster should go moving forward and whether or not you actually hire that person. Again, in my opinion, you'd be better off for having had that search. But the people I've spoken to are not sure that's going to happen before all these really critical decisions get made. And then once those decisions get made, don't you have to allow whoever was the point person making those, whether it's written into their contract or not, that they have 53-man roster control, don't you have to let somebody like Elliot Wolf, who does have the background to be a general manager in this league, who has the respect around the league, as an evaluator, as a relationship builder, as a leader from a front office standpoint. He is viewed as a general manager quality human being. Don't you have to allow him to see this thing through? You're all of a sudden going to bring in somebody over the top after the draft, after all these critical calls have been made, and you're going to bring in Scott Pioli to be his boss or Thomas Dimitrov to be his boss or John Robinson to be his boss or Dave Ziegler to be his boss. Now, I think what might be more likely, based on some of the conversations I've had from people in the industry, not claiming to know exactly what Robert Kraft or Jonathan Kraft or Gerard Mayo are thinking on this front as things stand right now, what might be more likely is not that you would bring somebody in to be Elliot Wolf's boss or Mac Rowe's boss after the draft, but maybe you would bring someone in to work with them. Maybe somebody like a Dave Ziegler, who has a good relationship with Elliot Wolf who is still on the books in Vegas, really good relationships with people here in New England, including ownership. Maybe that would work if you just feel like you need a little more brain power on top of what you already have. Again, and you have some really talented people in there between Wolf, Grow, Pat Stewart, Cam Williams, who's the college scouting director, Steve Cargill, who's the pro scouting director. It's a, it's a strong group. That's what league people would tell you. But do you want because you've, you've probably been understaffed relative to the rest of the league for some time now under Bill Belichick, would you just want even a little bit more brain power? And would somebody like Ziegler provide that? The decisions that get made on that front, on the personnel front, obviously are going to be critical in terms of the path that this team ends up taking this offseason. Because again, this offseason is what shapes your franchise's future long-term in the same way the 2021 offseason did when they were able to outspend the rest of the league because the rest of the league was coming off a COVID season and uh, their books just weren't set up in the same way that the Patriots were. And so they were able to make plays for guys that they might not have been able to in a depressed market in other years. And obviously they had the 15 overall pick, which for them at the time felt high. It ain't number three overall but they got a quarterback and you were off and running for the next three years. At least that's what they thought. It's a massive, massive off season. And whoever's calling the shots now, in my opinion, and through the draft, in my opinion, deserves to be able to see the thing through for several years. You can't evaluate these guys on the calls they're making before that. Unless you go into these meetings as Robert Kraft might or Jonathan Kraft might or others might, and it's so dysfunctional in there that you just can't stand it. You just can't have it. It's not to a standard that you're comfortable with 
three, two, one. It's just not to a standard that you're comfortable accepting. But I can tell you that's not going to happen. <laughs> They've been around these people for a long time. They understand what they're about. They understand how they work. They understand how intelligent these guys are. So that whole question of evaluation, and we're going to evaluate the guys we have in-house. You're going to evaluate them over the next two or three weeks? How much sense does that make? No, this is a, this is a longer-term evaluation process that you're going to have to make that you've already undertaken. These guys have been in your building for multiple years, all of them. Uh, maybe outside Pat Stewart, who, who rejoined the team, but had been with the team previously. And so you know, know a lot about him, too. But these guys aren't new to the club. The crafts understand to a degree what they have in them. And so if there is an evaluation process that goes on here, my guess is it's over the long haul. All right, that's it for this week's edition of the Next Pats podcast. So thanks so much for sticking with us, you guys. I know it's been a uh, busy week. There's been a lot of content flying at you, especially from NBC Sports Boston. Videos, podcasts, written work. All online, our shows have been jam-packed with Patriot storylines, so we appreciate you for following it all. As always, continue to follow us. We're going to be at the Super Bowl very soon. It's always a very productive week for the next Pats podcast. We're going to start getting some great draft guests in here to get us prepped for maybe a quarterback, maybe a tackle, maybe a receiver. Huh? Huh? We're going to have all the information you could ever want on the 2024 NFL Draft. The most important draft, probably since Drew Bledsoe. It's been a while, folks. Some of you were not alive. You had not yet reached this earth 30 years ago to see that Drew Bledsoe draft. So this is it. This is a big one. And we're going to have you covered better than anybody in the market, kid. Okay? We'll talk to you next week.